Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's The Q, covering Red Hat Summit 2017, brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back, I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with Stu Miniman, my co-host. We are joined by Sandra Rivera, Vice President and General Manager, Network Platform Groups at Intel. Thanks so much, Sandra. Thank you for having me. I want to talk about a point you made during your keynote address, and you talked about the transformative power of data, mm -hmm. and just about how data will change the face of so many industries, from healthcare to airlines to the financial services industry. Mm -hmm. And yet, there are so many challenges that companies and developers themselves face mm -hmm. in dealing with this avalanche of data, right. sifting through it, understanding it, sorting right. it, chunking right. it the right way, right. and really understanding what it's saying. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the challenges and then also what companies are doing to overcome the challenge? Yeah, so um, it is really the, at the crux of the both challenge and opportunity is what do you do with all the massive amounts of data that are being generated and I spoke about how you know an average user really generates or consumes about one and a half gigabytes of data per day but if you fast forward of what's happening in the rest of the industry with connected cars at four terabytes of data per day or connected planes at five terabytes or or a smart factory at one petabyte of, of data a day. What do you do with all of that? Um, because today, much of that goes wasted and unutilized, right? We create these large data lakes and yet the value creation portion that, that you need to turn it into something useful and, uh, and profitable is, is really challenging. And the things that we're doing to address those challenges collectively with the ecosystem are really building uh, standardized sets of software interfaces and APIs through our contributions in open source and open standards um, because we do believe that these are problems that are best addressed when you're doing it in community and in parallel and much of the investments that we're making in the underlying ingredient technologies, be it hardware or software, have to be exposed at a much higher level that you know for the application developer they know that there are some tools underneath giving them performance or uh, capabilities that they desire for their customers but not having to know a lot of those intricacies so a lot of that abstraction work that we do collectively with the ecosystem and I mean Red Hat being a great partner of ours uh, in that in that vein in that effort is really to abstract all those complexities and make it easier to on board the developers and, and let them innovate and, and really focus on the value creation portion of, of the, the problem statement. And does and so do developers now need a new layer of education to to yeah. to get the data. Yeah, well in so fact need data science. Yeah, exactly. Well a lot and a lot you see a lot of uh, the larger corporations hiring in uh, data scientists, but everyone is not going to be a data scientist and everyone's not going to be able to afford uh, one on their payroll. So our job is really to have again this abstraction capability but but one that takes advantage of the underlying uh, innovations that we invest in, both from a hardware and a software uh, perspective, and then to really try to pr provide some of that education capability. And some of the things that I spoke about are, as part of our community, a uh, community we call the builders community. Builders, uh, in fact, I, I was trying to uh, get folks to go look at builders.intel.com because you see we have you know, hundreds and hundreds of publications there, solution briefs and technical documents and reference architectures and tips and tricks and techniques for how you can optimize your software to take advantage of all of these innovations underneath. Um, instead of doing that trial and error that, uh, that w you would do if you're just kind of starting from ground up and, and doing it and repeating that same process over and over again. It's really embracing much more of that DevOps uh, model, which is new to the networking industry, but very familiar to the IT type developer. Yeah. Sandra, I wonder if you can help us connect the dots. I think back yeah. to when we started talking about the term big data. Yeah. Uh, one of the terms I loved, it was the bit flip from that, all this data is going to be a challenge to, hey, this is an opportunity for us to do good things. But when you start talking about the evolution now to machine learning, yeah. artificial intelligence, yeah. you know, big data, there's so many companies that are like, we tried these initiatives and over 50% of them were failing. We just weren't delivering on the value, we were investing, but we weren't there. Why will it be different? You know, how has the ecosystem matured and you know, it, it, this yeah. kind of maturation of yeah. the market? Yeah, well a lot of it is really about how do you make um, the access to all of that data look like another 
compute problem. Um, and, and we have a lot of compute application developers that are very familiar with the types of software tools and optimization capabilities that we have, uh, not just in the Intel portfolio, but in the ecosystem uh, through our efforts in open source and open standards. So, um, so I think that we learned that trying to dig down and get um, every ounce of optimization from the hardware by hard coding uh, to a lot of those uh, interfaces is not the fastest way to bring a broad community of developers on board. And the investments that we have been making is in trying to both uh, build up from a software stack perspective, but also build out our capabilities in our existing software tool chains that we have, that we have you know, hundreds of thousands of developers that, that are familiar with developing to those interfaces. And when you, when you do that, or when we've been doing that, we, we don't think that the uh, application developer will particularly care, or should particularly care, if, it's a, if it's the, uh, that workload is running uh, partly on a general purpose processing CPU, uh, partly in an FPGA, which is another asset and capability that, that we have and is, is highly programmable, or running in a, an ASIC environment, which is another capability that we brought into the company, specifically around uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence uh, through an acquisition of a company by the name of Nirvana. So, so again, all of those are your building blocks, but, but our job is to create the software environment that does just lets, lets you put it together like Lego blocks as opposed to really having to know all the intricacies uh, and complexities of the underlying ingredient technologies. And, and how does the, the open source initiatives help us get to that customization that I might need for specific verticals uh, and help accelerate the growth for everyone? Well, you know, a lot of the investments that we've been making is both in the virtualization layer, but also in container types of technologies. Uh, I talked about uh, the OpenShift uh, initiative that we have with, with Red Hat and with other partners where we're, we're looking at you know, Docker and Kubernetes and, and container types of deployment models in addition to uh, VM types of deployment models. If you look at everything that is happening in the industry and the investment that's going there, it really is very much around up-leveling the tools so that you can take advantage of the underlying capabilities, but you do have opportunities for customization that don't require necessarily programming micro-engines uh, down at, you know, at, at the, the you know, bare metal layer, or lower layers of, of the hardware stack. So it, it very much is the, the playbook around, if you want to enable a broad ecosystem, you have to lower the barriers to entry, you have to give them a tool chain that they they can more easily adapt to or, or program to, and you have to show them opportunities by working directly with the end customers to, again, um, we talked about you know, financial industry or healthcare industry that, that allows you to optimize for the, the problem that the problems that they're facing or the, the opportunities that they see as well. So some of some of the work we do is not just on the technology side, but very much in terms of matchmaking to the end customers and um, and doing the proof of concepts and you know doing the learnings and that iterative process of of just uncovering the things that you thought were going to be big problems sometimes aren't, and the things that you didn't anticipate would be challenges uh, sometimes are. And I mean, it's, just, it's, it's hard work, but, um, but it actually is, is really being successful in terms of there's a lot of interest in this area, there's many more tools, there's more investment going in, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity for, for innovation and growth. And particularly with the emerging force of uh, artificial intelligence and 5G, that really will have a transformative effect on the way we customers, just individual customers, interact with these industries. Yeah. And you had some great examples. Yeah, so, and yeah, I talked a little bit about uh, a banking application and that sort of nat natural language uh, processing that happens and the ability to have an AI assistant that can help you when you just speak in, in the regular um, sentences and, and syntax, but also get smarter over time to learn your individual habits and preferences and, uh, and then can you know, sometimes really 
will provide advice, not just answer questions, but actually provide some uh, investment advice, let, let's say. Uh, we talked about AI uh, in sports, which is a, another great uh, area for application of artificial intelligence and learning you know, movements and motion and form of, of an athlete's swing or an athlete's um, you know, form uh, or position as they're, they're doing their, or they're exercising their, their sport. Um, but one of the other areas that, that we're seeing a lot of application is in um, in something as old as agriculture, right? Which is a 23,000 year old uh, industry, but uh, you know, smart and connected cows and smart and connected wine, uh, which is a wonderful application. Sure, yeah, sign me <laughs> but up. for the farmers to, to understand uh, the soil quality and to uh, know what you know the forecast and the moisture and the the sunshine and the rainfall and I mean all of these things really allow them to be more effective and have a higher output, uh, more successful crops, more profits, and even their farming equipment. Right, all the sensors that are in farming equipment to be able to uh, predict a failure of the equipment or a service requirement for that piece of equipment. So all of these things that you you realize that once you're once Anything that can be smart and connected is going to be uh, smart and connected. I mean, we fundamentally believe that at Intel, that uh, that whether you're talking about sports and skateboards and, and bikes, uh, or you're talking about industries, financial, medical, uh, certainly is a huge one, um, the education or agriculture, there's so many opportunities for you to, uh, to really have that value creation element of the, the data collection uh, process. I want to ask you also about the technology industry and the community within the technology industry. It's getting a bad rap these days. Mm. There's, there's very little diversity, there's very few women, particularly in leadership positions, very few minorities. I know that this is a, a cause that you champion, uh, personally and professionally. What First of all, is it as bad as the headlines uh, when you're in it? And second, what are you doing to change it, um, both as an individual leader and at in, and what Intel yeah. is doing? Um, well, this is something that Intel is deeply committed to from our CEO, through our leadership team, and, and really driving uh, throughout the organization. And it isn't just because it's the right thing to do, diversity is the right thing to do, but it just makes business sense. If you look at um, just uh, just women in general and women and men, women make over half of the purchasing decisions uh, in a family and actually in the household they make more than half the purchasing decisions uh, for the big ticket items. And so it's kind of dumb to not include more women uh, in leadership positions that could have a different perspective on product development and features and, and trade-offs and, and capabilities and just uh, you know, organically what you do in terms of your own uh, product innovation. But beyond that, uh, we also know that any organization that has diversity, and it, it's men, it's women, it's ethnicity, it's um, experience, large company, small company, um, it's you know, different cultures and backgrounds, you will drive a better business result. I mean, the data uh, proves it over and over and over again that you are quicker to uh, innovate, you're quicker to find and identify problems, you're quicker as a team to just move to something that is more innovative, faster, and, and it's proven that all of those, uh, the companies that have more diversity on their boards and in their senior leadership team do drive better business outcomes. So, so from that perspective, it's again, it's it's the right thing to do, but it's also make it also makes good business sense. But it is a complex problem, and at Intel, I mean, we we certainly know it's a pipeline problem that starts at a very young age in terms of just getting uh, particular more girls interested in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, then uh, when they graduate, it's it's you know attracting them to uh, to come and really uh, be engineers and to you know maintain that that technical uh, passion that they they have and sometimes in the face of a lot of adversity because we know that sometimes they um, their inputs uh, uh, get uh, marginalized or discounted um, but then we find that even after we've made it all through that uh, that it's a retention problem from the perspective that women want to see a career progression just like men do, and uh, and typically 
uh, that is just a bigger challenge for women because the, the people that make those decisions or provide those opportunities, um, there's not enough women that are advocating, frankly, not, not just women, but they're not the men that are advocating for those women. So we have a lot that we're investing in this very multifaceted problem. It is a journey, um, but to your point, I, I'm not discouraged. I really do think it's better than it's ever been. And, and the um, bro culture, I mean, is, is that, I mean, you, is you, you talked about the women who may get discouraged because their inputs, if they're, they're not called on in a meeting, they're not chosen for that, that yeah. cool new project. Yeah. I yeah. mean, and that, that is deflating. Well, it is deflating, and, and those are the things that you have to address. But, but one, of the, one of the ways that we have found um, to do that is that you have to assume that there is a bias, mm -hmm. right? We all have biases. Mm -hmm. This is one thing that we, we learn <laughs> is that if you have a brain, you have a bias. It's not good or bad, it's just, it just is. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many ways to overcome those biases. There's all kinds of, of ways. I mean, we, we know this from studies that were done. Um, uh, women that were trying out for the Philharmonic you know, or, or orchestra in, in New York. If you did uh, the, the, blind audition. the audition yes. behind the, the curtain, they were chosen like 50% more of the time than if they, they weren't uh, behind the curtain because you, you just tend to, your bias is that, well, I didn't hear them play that well, but but you don't, it's unconscious. You don't realize that you're actually doing that. So so there's so many ways that you can overcome the, the unconscious bias, but you have to acknowledge that it exists. And once it exists, then there's there's, there's a lot of tools and and, uh, and techniques that we employ at Intel in terms of having more diverse panel, hiring panels, um, having more diverse candidates that you're bringing in, um, and uh, establishing your criteria for hiring before you meet the candidates, and then you know assessing each candidate against that criteria so that you don't get to kind of change your mind after afterwards. I mean, there's there's lots of ways, but truly, I am very encouraged. I I do. I mean, I've been at this a long time, and I think it is a much better environment now than it was. It's nowhere where we need to be, but um, but I, I yeah, the, the culture is, is tough, but it's not as bad as it was, and it is getting better every day. Great, well thank you so much, Sandra Rivera. We appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. We'll be back with the, with the wrap just after this.